Hi, my name is Heather Richmond. Welcome to the channel. Hope everyone is doing well. And as always, thank you to those of you who have taken the time to reach out, share my work, ask questions, make comments. Those things are truly always appreciated. So this is episode, um, I think probably about 22 or 23 um, in my Voices in Ascension series. And today I'm so fortunate to be able to speak with um, a very special woman that I met um, a few months back. Uh, her name is Shireen. And Shireen is a breath coach here, located here in Houston. And um, Shireen, if you feel called to, if you want to just kind of briefly um, speak more about that, about what you do in your studio and, and your other business endeavors, feel free. Absolutely. So um, hi, Heather. I'm so happy to be here with you as well. And it truly is a blessing to have crossed paths with you. Thank you for having me on the show. Um, my name is Shireen Youssef. I um, own a studio called Suda Prem Studio, which means pure love. Um, right here in Houston, very close to downtown in the greater third ward area. Um, and I essentially utilize breath, cold, and movement as the three main, main modalities that I work with to help people um, find whatever they're looking for, essentially. I think there's a real wide range of people that come across, that come to the studio looking for different things, you know? So I would say the common, common uh, trait amongst almost everybody who comes into my studio is that they're all on some sort of journey where they're seeking something, seeking to become better versions of themselves, seeking to get better, seeking to perform higher, um, seeking to compete more, you know? So there's a, there's a level of seek uh, present in, yes. in everybody that comes. Yeah, absolutely. I, I can see that. And just in the, the brief time that I, that I spent there over a few different, um, classes, I, I certainly noticed that as well. And one of the things that I truly appreciated about my experience there, um, with you and the, the women's group that you led was how, uh, particularly the ice that um, impacted me probably more than anything. And it, it really, if for those of you who may not be familiar, essentially an ice bath is, you know, what it sounds like. And you get in the cold for, um, you know, at least two minutes, I guess. And you, um, it shocks the, the nerve. I'm sure I won't explain this adequately, but it shocks the nervous system essentially and sort of recalibrates things. And um, anyhow, that's not something I ever had experience with prior to that. And I remember the first time it was, it was uh, truly shocking in, <laughs> in a variety of ways. And I, I went into it thinking, oh, I've got this. I've mastered my mind. I you know, I can do anything, all is mine, whatever. And it shook me up. And <laughs> I thought for a minute, you know, I can't do this. I can't do it. And there were just these beautiful women standing around me saying, you know, cheering me on. And I just heard so clearly my inner voice saying, just keep going. And I did. And, and that's so symbolic of just this journey in general, you know, yeah. uh, and I'm sure, I'm sure that many people who um, have that experience in the ice, you know, probably experience similar as well. Correct. Right. Yeah. So, okay, Shereen. So like in, um, in the context of your business and the, the ways that you are helping people. Um, I, I, we want to know, I'm curious about more of your own personal journey and yours is a very unique story. So I just really felt like people would benefit from, from hearing your perspective. So I know this question is always a little tough to, to pin down, but if you had to identify, you know, a, a time period, how long have you been on this path of, of spiritually seeking? 
So um, truly, Heather, I believe it has been going on since the first memory I had, you know, because I, as a child, um, you know, I grew up in the Middle East uh, in a country called Oman. I was born there. I'm Indian by origin um, and my mother's from Singapore. So I had influences from, you know, these three areas growing up, whether it was through food, whether it was through clothing, whether it was even through hairstyles, you know, it's interesting how small little things make an impact, you know, people that you meet, things that you do, food that you eat, dresses that you wear, um, it all makes an impact. And I remember that um, my first ever memory is, uh, I think I was four years old and I wrote an essay. Um, what would you do if you had a million, million dollars or million, I can't remember the currency, you know, million reals. Yeah, it was probably a million real. Uh -huh. And um, in that, um, my mom talked about how I literally gave that million dollars away to everybody else. You know, I bought stuff for my mother. I wanted her to have a string of pearls and I wanted to give away a significant portion of my money to the people in Somalia. Um, and I was so young, you know, and it's interesting because I don't know why. I don't know where that came from. I don't know where, it, what sparked that need for me to want to give money away, but it never even, you know, never even was a doubt in my mind that most of the money that I got would go to others, you know? And also um, this was something that my brother reminded me. I forgot about it actually. Uh, we used to have a cupboard, you know, I don't know if that's what you call here in the US too. Basically, uh, yeah, um, a wardrobe kind of a, yeah, with doors. Okay, yeah. Um, and so uh, on the, and it, um, ours was made of wood, you know, and, I would with chalk write on the front door things I wanted to do in my life. And one of the things that I wrote was to help others. I wanted to bring joy to others, you know, and at a very young age, I mean, this is, you know, in my, in my first five years of my life, these were some of the memories that my parents um, shared with me, you know, and I, around the same time uh, I played tennis. I, I started playing tennis at the age of four as well which um, breath was such a significant part of, <laughs> of any sport that you play, you know, but, um, you know, learning to get stronger. I was a very, very thin, feeble girl. You know, if anybody saw me today, they would never believe it, but I was very lanky and very, very thin. And my, uh, my wrists and my, my arms were so feeble. And it was actually through tennis that I became, my, my body structure became what it is. Um, so yeah, that is, um, I, I would say pretty much all my, the, the, since the first memory I've had, that's when my part, my path has begun. That's beautiful. That's so beautiful. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I can imagine, um, yeah, it, it that feels, um, you know, like a, a uh, very serendipitous first <laughs> memory to have for sure and that's beautiful that's such a gift that you're able to to remember that and have your parents you know share that with you as well and so that's that's truly beautiful that you've continued to live that out you know yeah. so um I know that you recently um converted in your um your subscription to religion mm -hmm. um and if you feel called to speak about that um i'd be curious to know you know what was the context for that and and was there any sort of one thing that you know triggered that desire to seek out catholicism rather sure. than what you grew sure. up with absolutely i uh yeah I, I would love to talk about it um so I grew up Muslim um, and I would say that, you know, like most of us, uh, my religion and my religious values were probably instilled into me by my grandmother. You know, she was the person I, her name is uh, Nafisa. Uh, she's the person that I probably spent um, the most amount of time with growing up. She used to oil my hair. Um, you know, I had very long hair growing up. And, you know, when I look back at my grandmother, I only have 
images of love and care. You know, she was very caring and very loving towards me. And she was extremely intelligent too. So, you know, learning religion from her was uh, probably a gift that I received because she never at any point in time made it sound like religion was a, I have to do it, you know. Uh, it was more of, I enjoyed spending time with her. And so every time she prayed, I prayed with her. And, you know, it was a, it's, it's a little difficult to explain this, uh, but I think uh, some of you all might understand it. You know, I grew up with a religion that I didn't understand the language of. So I said things that I didn't know what I was saying. Um, I went through the motions without really know, knowing what I was doing, but I enjoyed the act of actually sharing these motions with my grandmother. Right. So that was really what religion was for me for the first 10 years. And then um, she passed away when I was about 11 or 12 years old. And uh, things took a very drastic turn for me at that point. Um, you know, I, I had already reached a pretty significant um, stage in tennis at that point. And I was in India and I was playing uh, competitively and um you know, I, I always prayed, but, you know, I, my grandmother wasn't around, so I wasn't as, you know, drawn to praying the way I was uh, when I was with her. And I um, kind of became the person who prayed on on need basis. You know, I would I would I had an important match that came up, you know, so so uh, quickly, let's do the let's do the prayers before that important match. Or, you know, when when just before I went onto the court, I would say some prayers and I would say prayers like the Aital Kursi and things like that, which were just, you know, I didn't know what I was saying. I just by hearted all of these prayers and I was just saying them, you know, running through the motions. Um and of course, I had a I had a fallout with religion, pretty much at a point when I recognized I was not getting support to continue on my journey of tennis. You know, I felt like um, back in Oman, there were a lot of people who could have sponsored me, but I was not sponsored because I was not Omani. I was not from the country itself. And then a lot of people in my family that knew of my talent were not willing to help my family, you know, because tennis is a very ex ex expensive sport, it's very expensive sport. And, um, you know, my dad couldn't afford all of the, you know, and I, I was an extremely hard hitter and I would break my strings, you know, so often. And um, it was not easy. It was not easy on my family and we didn't have anyone. We had a lot of rich people in my family and nobody stepped up and you know, at least from what I understood is nobody felt that it was a very Islamic thing to be doing, you know, to have a daughter who wore shorts and who played tennis, you know, so it really hurt me, you know, I was very, I was very hurt. And the reality is, I don't know, actually, I don't know the true reasons for why my path took the, the turn that it did. But I think what matters is what registered in my mind, you know, and what registered in my mind was, I am going through this because I'm Muslim. You know, and it may or may not have been what was actually the message that was being given, but it was what I experienced, you know. And so I sensed a certain sense of hatred towards um, the religion because it kept me away from my only love. That was my first love. Tennis was my first love. And it was, it broke my heart, you know. And I mean, um, you know, I moved on, I kind of became a person who didn't really care. So I won't say I became an advocate of no religion. I just became a person who didn't have an opinion. I didn't have an opinion on religion. I didn't have an opinion of God. I didn't have an opinion on anything. And today I would say that, you know, I definitely, those were my atheist years. You know, I didn't really care. I didn't care. People said things pro God, not God. You know, it didn't matter to me. In fact, I would think, why are you wasting time? I get to work. There's so much work that needs to be done, you know. Um, and I. That's so I would, funny knowing you now to, to think, <laughs> think of you speaking that way. That's funny. <laughs> so it was um, it was an interesting period of my life. I would say that went on from the age of about ten or eleven, or maybe a little later too, because it it became very intense in my mid teens. So about 14, 14, 15, all the way through. Uh, till definitely my early 30s, you know, and um, I would say that uh, I'm, I'm 37 right now. So my last four years have probably been very intense, but the I would say that my age between um, about nine or 10 
till about 33, I would say was all in line of self-exploration fully. I, um, and, and I look back and I would consider those period, that period of my life, extremely spiritual, extremely, I never called it that, but I was always seeking, you know, I was always wanting to get to know my body better, my muscles better from tennis. When tennis was not an option, I got into marathons. I ran over 13 marathons. I did a bunch of ultra marathons. I then went into Ironmans. Um, and then I started doing something called through hiking, which is, you know, you take about seven or eight days or five, three to five days of hiking and you pretty much do it in 11 hours or so. So I continued to fast. So I um, noticed that fasting was very, it was, very, there was something very beautiful about fasting, you know, so I continued to fast. So even though there was nothing really Muslim about me at the time, I never ate pork. I, I continue to actually honor that. I still don't eat pork today. I, I never drank because I, well, I won't say I never, I would say I, Drinking was not a priority for me because of my tennis background. So yeah. I never really indulged in um, alcohol or um, drugs at any point in my in these years um, because I, I just continued to keep that very high level of physical fitness up. And so it required a very, very pronounced, um, for me at least, uh, you know, the need for me to take care of my body and my mind was very important. So, you know, especially like I got into sports like um, skydiving, I got into scuba diving, um, you know, it's, I joke about it, you know, I, I explored the depths and I explored the heights, you know, I mean, I climbed mountains. And so like, even though I consider these my atheist years, um, I was absolutely on a journey of self-exploration, which today I look back and I recognize that that was what was going on. You know, I learned how, my body can function on very little sleep. I've learned how my body could function on very little food. Um, you know, I, I used to do all sorts of different uh, experiments on my body, on my mind. I would put myself, I would sleep on the floor sometimes. Um, you know, I just put my body through so many different things in the uh, complete awareness of trying to recognize how much I was capable of, regardless of how little I had. And um, I would say in 2016, I would say that was when um, there was definitely a huge turn. In 2016, I tore my ACL. And when I tore my ACL, um, and again, you know, this, that should be no surprise, right? And it was interesting because I tore my ACL playing tennis. So it was interesting how it was full circle for me, where tennis was such an important part of my life. And I found my love back for tennis because I refused to get back on the court. I was so mad. I was so angry. And I refused to get back on the court. And uh, I finally did it. I finally got back on the court. I became, I, I was able to play leagues again. I started competing again. People started noticing me again. I started getting invited to um, certain country clubs to play at. And in one of these tournaments, I tore my ACL, right? So um I that was the beginning truly I, th I would say that that moment was the start of me sitting silently um and I realized because it was you know I did what every athlete would do I went into rehab got out out of it in six or seven months you know it was insane people had never seen anyone come out of an ACL surgery that quickly um I, I was motivated I was driven you know I knew exactly what I needed to do and I knew my body so well. Um, and right the day that I got released to say, yeah, you're absolutely welcome to go back uh, to do everything you were doing before. I had a completely unrelated injury on the other side. And when that healed, a completely unrelated injury on my other side. And this kept going on. And then I, it hit me. I felt like somebody was telling me to shut up and sit down. Yes. And so I, I did. I sat. And that was, that was the beginning, right? So that was in 2016. And I, um, I remember I thought to myself, well, uh, you know, all of the friends I had and all of the people I knew and all of the things I did, um, they're not in my life anymore. You know, I mean, I was still going to work, but, you know, I had all these friends through sport and, you know, I was doing ecstatic dance at the time. And, you know, there were all these different things I did and I couldn't do any of it. 
And I, um, and I mean, you have to recognize there were beautiful people in my life during this time too. And I think that that is also a very important, important piece of information, which I am very observant of today, which I don't think I was as observant back then, that the Lord sends us people, yes. sends us angels yes. to be in our lives. When these things are going on, they're present, they're present, you know, and I had angels in my life at this time too. Um, and it was beautiful because I uh, had companionship, uh, even though these people were people I had barely met two or three months before the accident happened. They were the right companions for this time, you know. And so I picked up, I remember thinking, well, I mean, these religious books have come from so long. What would they have? You know, I mean, and I, I will say that the Lord had gifted me with intelligence. You know, I had done my aerospace engineering degree moved over into petroleum engineering, lived in 11 or 12 different countries by now. You know, I had traveled the world. I definitely had a sense of pride about myself. You know, I felt I was, uh, you know, I was very smart and intelligent and I could pick up things very quickly. And, you know, I just thought to myself, well, you know, these books have been coming over centuries. I wonder what they contain, you know? So I started, started reading. I read, um, I picked up the Bible. I actually didn't read the New Testament. I read the Old Testament. And then I was intrigued by the Old Testament. And then I read a little bit, I picked up the Quran, picked up the Bhagavad Gita, picked up all of these different books from different religions, and I started reading them. And I won't say that they were all the same, actually, but I will say that they all talked about love. Yes. Love in a way that I did not understand. Yeah. And uh, unconditional love. And I realized in that moment, I had not experienced unconditional love. It was very, very harsh to say that because I love my parents very much. My parents love me very much. There's no doubt about it. But I do believe that there was a certain sense of expectation that I needed to attain. You know, and it, it, I don't blame anybody for it. I think, you know, I, I'm Indian and Indians are put under a lot of pressure. We have to perform and we do well in our class. And, you know, if we don't, you know, it's very clear that, you know, there was a level of disappointment that surrounded me. I did not understand this love that was present that accepted me as I was, you know? And so that began the journey of, um, of um, you know, Heather, I'm just laughing because I think I may have answered a bunch of questions. <laughs> it's totally okay. <laughs> in, this one, in this one answer. But basically that, um, that was the beginning of my journey of pursuing what love meant. That was, that was when it started. It was in 2016. And I, like, like you might have realized this already, I'm a person, if I want to know something, I go all in, like full head, body, mind, everything. You know, I just fully go in and I want to know everything about love. I want to understand love, you know. And it was so interesting that during this time that I was on this journey of understanding what love meant, um, that breath came into my life at the same time. And breath came in the form of the Wim Hof method, right? So breath has been a part of my life, my entire life. And, you know, I had practiced Qigong, I had practiced Pranayama, and I'd done all of these things because I was obviously immobile. And so I kept, kept my energy up by doing all of these breath exercises. And so when I came back from my little bit of, you know, pretty much because once I came out of my ACL injury, even the other, even though I had other injuries, I was able to go back to life, you know, and, you know, of course, knowing me, I was already training for my next um, journey and my next mountain. And, you know, I had climbed uh, up to, I'd gone to Everest base camp and I'd gone to Machu Picchu and, you know, I was going higher and higher and started climbing higher mountains in Denver. So I wanted to go up, um, you know, Aconcagua, which was in South America. And I realized very quickly, I hate the cold, hate, hate, hate the cold, you know. And so um, recognizing that hatred that I had towards the cold, I essentially, um, you know, people started directing me to try this method of Wim Hof method, right? Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, I mean, I'm just going to abridge this version because, gosh, my Wim Hof method journey in itself is, is an entire podcast of its own, you know. Sure. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to abridge that and just say, that when I met Wim, I um, recognized he loved me. He didn't know me, but he loved me. And he called me Sudha Prem, which means pure love. And so it was this mutual recognition 
you know, and it was that moment that I realized, and, and you know, I, I, you know, in Christianity, we say we only have one teacher and the teacher is Jesus Christ. You know, we are all brothers in the light of Christ. Uh, but, you know, we have given this word, this word teacher, master, coach, we have given these words. Truly, though, what it means is we are teaching, as a Christian, I'm now speaking for me, I am teaching in the light of Christ, yes. right? I am, I am a master in the light of Christ, you know? And of course, I didn't know it at that time. But when I met Wim, for me, Wim was my teacher in the light of Christ. At that time, I did not know Christ. But today... When I look back, I recognize Christ was working through him. Sure. You know? Yes. And so it was, it was that awareness, you know, no, no pride, so humble. You know, Wim is such a humble man, such a beautiful man, you know, and he is so um so loving, so caring, you know. And for him to like look at me and say the same things, you know, which I still think I have a long way to go in my humility, in my pride, you know, I still have a lot to work on in that front. But to hear him see that in me, he understood that at least I was striving. I was striving. Maybe I didn't know where I was striving to go, but at least I was striving, you know. And it was in that trip that he asked me, when will you start teaching? And I looked at him and I thought, I think you misunderstood Wim. I'm not a teacher. I'm an engineer. And he said, no, you are a teacher. You just don't know it yet. Wow. You know, so I, I just looked at him and I thought, okay, whatever. <laughs> right? And I was just like, yeah, whatever, you know. But I will say that he has been a force. Wim has been a force in my life till this point. I'm very grateful I met him when he was not as big. So I'm, I, and at the time I probably was his only Indian instructor. And I, I still don't know if there are any other Indian instructors. So till this point, but you know, I, I felt a certain level of love for him as I would for my own family, which is interesting, you know, because as a Christian now, that is how I feel towards everybody I meet. Everyone, yes. You know, <laughs> is that is what we are called to as, as Christians. We're called to love each and other. E love everyone as we love ourselves. Our first commandment is to love God with all our heart, mind, and soul. And our second commandment is to love our neighbor as we love ourselves, you know. And so when, when, I, met, uh, when I met Wim, it was that kind of love that I felt. I couldn't explain it, but I experienced it. And this is the thing about love. You cannot talk about it. You cannot read about it. You have to experience it. When you experience it, you know it is, it is different. It is fulfilling. It, is, it makes your heart just want to burst, you know, with joy. And, and you have this sense of peace that goes through your, your body. And so I tell people, I was not pursuing God. I was not pursuing God. I was pursuing love. I was pursuing love. And in pursuit of love, I found God because God is love. Yes. You know, yes. so that that was kind of the beginning, you know. And of course, like I said, I can talk about my whole Wim Hof journey because that in itself is its own journey. But I ended up becoming a coach. I ended up teaching. Um, and one year into teaching, I was in Poland for a week. You know, I had just climbed up Concagua. It was a very tough trip. I came back, um, I was in Poland and, you know, we had a, a week and Wim was there and, you know, it was very trying. You know, we have to go through different things, walk on ice, you know, barefoot and uh, being, you know, freezing under, under freezing temperatures, uh, running water. And, you know, we put ourselves through all of these things. And uh, I was in a bar in Poland, a bar, you know, <laughs> and that was when my first encounter happened. My first encounter with God happened in at that moment, right there in that bar. And, uh, you know, like I said, that in itself is its own. I, I could talk about that for an hour. I don't have words to explain it. But all I will say is it was like my heart tore apart and love flowed out of my heart, you know. And I, I was in the bar and I could not, I could not. I could not, I just could not explain what was going on. It was like my body, I had, I was having an out of body experience. Everything was happening and I wasn't doing anything. I was literally in this bar having a good time with friends. And I was having all of this happen to me in the midst of all of this. And what really blew my mind was people who didn't know me turned towards me and started talking to me and started telling me, I don't know who you are, but I feel like you love me. And that was when it hit me that, wow, this isn't only happening within me. There is something 
that is going on that even others are experiencing too. Yes. yes. And it wasn't only that day, it continued for a day or so. Cause I remember I went to a bar and like, there was a, a concert going on and the singer at the concert was drawn to me. Like it was so random, like all these random things started. Well, it, they were not random, right? right like right. for me, I was just kind of thinking, you know, again, remember I'm still an atheist during all this time, you know, it's just, I'm just trying to figure out what is going on, you know? And so I, I came back and truly Heather, that was, that was the moment. So like, I would say the ACL injury was the first, the real moment where I said, I know what I experienced. I experienced God. I, I could not turn away from that. Like it was so clear to me, so clear to me that I had an experience that was not human. It was not in the realm of humanity, you know? And I uh, pretty much came home and I started meditating. I started meditating long hours. And, and I'm not really sure why. I don't know what drew me towards silence, but I would do the Wim Hof method and I would pretty much sit in silence for hours and hours. And during this time, I should actually mention somebody which, um, yes, this is actually a very important, wow, it just actually occurred, entered into my head. I haven't talked about this in a long time, but there is a person by the name of Paramahamsa Yogananda, right? And I'd actually, I have a college, a college mate. He was my senior in college. He's actually um, a Brahmacharya. I guess he's a Swami. He might now be a Brahmacharya in, um, in under this uh, line of Paramahamsa Yogananda. And it's called, I believe it's called uh, self-realization. That's the line. Okay. So I had gone, when I had torn my ACL, I had actually gone to the ashram in India uh, and I had visited my college mate. So I'd actually really gone to visit my college mate. But while doing that, I met a Brahmachari in this um, place which taught me who, who was the first person to talk to me about meditation. And I was really not interested. <laughs> I just want you to know, like, I was just kind of like, uh, sure, whatever, you know, because like my entire life to that point, I feel like I was always meditating through my sports or whatever. Like people would always talk about meditation and I was just like, oh, whatever, you know, but he was the first brahmachari that sat down with me and he said something to me, like, I remember I closed my eyes and he asked me, did you see anything? And I said, ah, I saw something white. I saw a white light, right? I remember saying that, right? And I was just like, I don't know what that means, but I thought, I, would, you know, I don't know. And then he looked at me and he said, you know, Shireen, um, I, ex I felt it when you walked in, but you are a very old soul. You are a very old soul and you know a lot. And I'm very... I." the part that shocked me was when he said, I'm very honored to be in your presence. Wow. Right. And I'm just like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's beautiful. So I'm just kind of like looking at him like, yeah, man, whatever. <laughs> 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 right. But like, literally like, you know, I look at it as, as well as even that trip of mine was an act of love. You know, this was, this was a college mate of mine that I knew for six months. And he went to Silicon Valley. He was an extremely accomplished man and he left everything. He left everything and he, he went into sannyas, you know, which is you leave everything and you go, that's, a, that's an Indian term. And he just left everything and went into this ashram, you know? And I, uh, it was out of love for him that I went there. I wasn't going there to see God or to seek, you know, anything that Paramahamsa Yogananda had to teach me or, anything like that. I literally went to meet him because I really wanted to see him again, you know? And so like, I, I do recognize that there has always been a trend of love in my life, you know, whether it was doing things for my friends or doing things, going out of the way because this ashram was in a place that was so out of the way of any city. Like I really had to, you know, it was not easy to get to the city, you know, it was completely out of the way. And I really wanted to go see him, you know? So, um, so yes, yeah, so, yeah I, it's kind of funny, it came to my mind, but I wanted to mention him too, because I know one of your questions was, were there any specific teachers or yes. people who had a major, definitely Paramahamsa Yogananda was, was a part of that journey, you know? And, um, and so, yeah, so basically I came back from that trip. And so again, this is prior to Wim Hof. So I didn't know Wim Hof at all. So I kind of missed this. 
And that was kind of where I was kind of intrigued with the whole meditation concept, but I did not do it, right? I was intrigued with it and I was reading about it and I was curious about it, but I didn't do it, right? And so this is the other thing I think is very important is there is a huge difference between experience and knowledge, huge, sure. right? Yes. Because you yes. can yeah. know a lot of things, a lot, but if you don't experience it, it is of no value, truly, absolutely none, right? So, um, so yeah, so basically uh, it was when I came back from this Poland trip that when I started doing the Wim Hof method, I continued from the method, I started staying in hours and hours of silence, right? And again, like I said, you talked about teachers, another teacher came in during this time, uh, which was, what is his name? His name is, um, it, it will come to me. Um, he basically is in charge, I think he does pranic healing. Um, pranic healing, let me look at it. pranic healing. And I think his name is, whew, sorry. I should probably remember his name, it's okay. but yeah, it'll, it'll come up. So anyway, there is, there is actually, um, there is a studio here as well. I actually work with, with the lady, her name is Sarah, Sarah Stathatos, but she is, um, she's in, yeah, Master Ko, that's his name. So there was uh, another teacher that came in, Master Ko during this time. And I think his, his founder's grandmaster, Ch Cho Kok Sui. So he was another teacher that kind of came in, like I said, in my atheist days, right? This was all the, um, the kind of teachers that kind of came in, made an impact. I really loved pranic healing because he talked a lot about different uh, religions and all of these different, uh, how they all come together. And I mean, Heather, I have to say, I hated religion, right? Hated religion with a vengeance. And so like, you know, all of these things were really good. Like I was grateful that I got to experience all of these things because I feel like it was the way the Lord drew me closer and closer <laughs> through my path, you know? So I was like, I was into all of these things. And then I had all these Eastern things and Western things and all of these, so many different teachers, you know, I read Krishnamurti's books. I read all these different books from all these different, um, you know, uh, Indian teachers. And I remember there was another Indian teacher that came in that talked about Kundalini. And I went into that for a little while. And then there was a phase of mine that I would try psychedelics. So I did ayahuasca and I did psilocybin. And, you know, I came a lot, a lot of things came out of that. So all of this um, happened in a very intense one year period. Wow. Right. So like I completely submerged myself into all of these different things. And then one day I started hearing the voice of God in my heart. It just, it just came out of nowhere. I just started hearing the voice of God in my heart. And this voice started telling me to do things. And I, um, I, I didn't know how to, uh, I didn't know how to do them. They were just very hard, yeah. you know? And the hardest thing he told, the, the voice told me was to go back into religion. And I, I, I couldn't do it. I hated religion so much. I couldn't do it. And I kicked and shoved and fought and I just couldn't do it, you know, and I didn't want to do it. And I, all of my trauma associated with Islam came back up and all of the things that my parents had told me growing up and all of these different things, like, I just didn't want to have anything to do with religion, you know? And, um, but I did, I went back into it. I got back into Sufism and I, um, I became a devout Muslim became a devout Muslim for, for two years. And um, when I was in deep meditation last October uh, through Sufism, so I, I followed something called Naqshbandi, which was a silent line of Sufis, which is we sit in meditation twice a day for 40 minutes each time. And we focus on different parts of our body with 10 centers. And it's completely the mystical side of Islam. So I did this for a while and um, and yeah, in October of last year, when I was in prayer, uh, Jesus popped up and said, follow me. And I was completely confused because, you know, Jesus is a part of the Quran as well. And I, um, I, you know, I just thought, okay, uh, how, how am I supposed to follow you? And Mother Teresa popped up 
And so when I say popped up, it's like images, you know, like the awareness, the thought, the feeling, the, you know, like, and you know, it is not from you because I mean, I didn't think about Mother Teresa. So like, why would a thought of Mother Teresa pop up, you know? Right. Yes. And so, um, and so, yeah, so essentially um, I found out that I want, I was willing to go to New York at this point in my life, I was willing to do anything to just know I'm on the path to just know, because I, I didn't know, I, I was not sure. And I was willing to do anything. I was willing to give up anything and everything to just know that I'm on the path because I wanted to feel union with the Lord. That was all I wanted. I was so, I was thirsting for him. You know, I just wanted, I wanted to know I'm getting closer to him. So I was willing to do anything. And I called up New York and I said, I didn't know. I had no idea she was Catholic. I studied in Calcutta for four years and I never really knew much about Mother Teresa. All I knew was I thought at the time that she's a social worker, you know, it's kind of funny because she was not a social worker. She was a woman of God, you know, but like at the time I didn't know any better, you know? And so, um, so yeah, so like essentially I called up that house in New York and they said, where do you live? And I said, Houston. And they were like, oh, we have a house in Houston, a very established house actually. And uh, lo and behold, the house was seven minutes away. And I walked into their house and that was it. I knew, I knew that moment. Of course they didn't know, but I knew I was going to become Catholic. So that was it. And of course, everything happened so fast. I mean, it hasn't been an easy, it hasn't been an easy journey to convert from Islam to Catholicism. I caused my family a lot of pain. I'm still aware of the pain that they're going through. Um, very grateful for all of the people I encountered. Um, for my priest in St. Joseph Catholic Church, you know, his name is Father Victor. And he discerned um, very quickly that I was ready for baptism. I got baptized April 3rd. I still go to the Missionary of Charity. The sisters there are my family. You know, I, I go there almost every day. And, um, you know, through Christianity, I have truly received a family, you know, and I, through Christianity, like this is when I started doing things uh, on donation base. Like I just um, kind of shifted. A lot of things shifted in my life at that point. My life became a lot easier. Um, it is true. If you follow Christ, your burden does become light and your yoke is easy. It is true for me, even though everything I've done, I mean, you know, I quit my job two days ago. I've never felt so much peace in my life. You know, uh, this, like quitting my job was something I could never even fathom six months ago, you know, and here I was, I just very peacefully put in my resignation, you know, and I don't feel any, any, any turmoil in my heart or in my body. And my last day, September 8th, which is the birthday of Mother Mary, and so it's like, the Lord is always talking to me, always talking to me. And, you know, not only through his words anymore, not only through my heart anymore. He talks to me through other people. He talks to me through uh, things that are happening around me. He talks to me through the love I receive. And the reality is I am beginning to see the Lord everywhere. Yes. I understand why we are all connected and brothers and sisters. And, you know, it, yes, that is where I started, it, you know, feeling the sense of universal responsibility. That's kind of where you kind of made that comment about how, you know, I used to be, I was such a lukewarm person, Heather, such a lukewarm person, you know? And I look back at my life and um, I'm just so grateful. I'm so grateful for the, for, for the grace that the Lord has bestowed because I know, I know he didn't have to, you know, he loves me so much. He was just waiting. He was waiting for me to just notice him, you know? Um, and so that's it. I, I think I may have answered all your questions. <laughs> <laughs> I think you did, but it's okay. <laughs> that's perfect. And I so enjoyed listening to, to your story. It, it just flowed so nicely. So I did not want to interrupt you at all. But um, the thing that, that really stands out to me is this idea of love. And I, I should have looked it up, but I did not know that Sudaprem meant pure love. Um, but wow, I, I um, had a very similar experience in the beginning of my journey in terms of just opening my heart for like no discernible reason at the time. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. You know, you, you spoke about unconditional love. And if you had asked me four or five years ago, I would have said that unconditional love is not possible. We, it does not exist. You know, we're not capable of it. Um, but of course, through experience, uh, I have been led to <laughs> see otherwise for sure. And, um, you know, it's there's just this heart opening that 
that takes place and, and it absolutely sounds like um, spirit is in constant communication with you. And it's, it's so interesting too, because I know for me, and I'm guessing you can identify with this, um, when I look back at the way things have shifted for me over the past three years, um, there was so much that that has transpired that I did not understand at the time. And I just, you know, similarly, I quit my job, you know, two years ago, left the classroom, um, you know, many other things that I just did not understand why it was happening at the time. And now, as I look back upon these things, it's like it all comes together and it's this beautiful poem and it all makes sense. So, yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I do think you covered most of our talking points here, um, but I do want to ask you kind of switching gears just a little bit. So we were speaking briefly, you and I, uh, before we started recording about, you know, some of the things that are transpiring in the world right now, mm-hmm. our current events and, um, you know, the fact that when we're on this this path, we kind of begin to view those things. And I speak about this at length and in a couple of my videos, but um, we begin to view these things from a more symbolic level. And we understand that God's hand is, is at work in all of these things. And so um, just whatever you feel called to speak about in terms of, you know, what's going on right now, um, you know, what's kind of your perspective on on things that are unfolding and and what do you see in store for us you know collectively in the the coming days and years sure so you know like i said i'm an engineer and so it's going to be very difficult for me to step away from that side of my life you know but i'm going to just share that this past year from a standpoint of like the students that have come to my studio because i think it makes sense for me to share my personal experience Um, there's definitely been an uptick of people who are looking for spiritual advancement. Um, And I've also noticed that there has been an uptick in depression, suicidal tendencies, anxiety, and stress-related issues, disorders, right? Um, I've also seen an uptick in uh, people who are just very, I mean, I I don't want to express it as um, fear, but basically just the level of uncertainty is so high that most people are just kind of confused on what direction to take, yes. right? And I, what I would suggest, the most important thing that we can do at this time is prayer. That is what I believe is a unifying force, you know? And I like the word prayer because prayer is universal. Prayer is not tied to religion even. Prayer as a word is just the awareness that I want well for others. I want the best for others. I want everyone to be in a better place, you know, and just the act of prayer in itself is so beautiful because when we come together and we pray together, there is a lot of unity in that action, you know, so that would be my, um, my two cents, you know, that nobody really knows where we're going. I'm not going to sit here and prophesy because it is not, um, It will be always different for every person walking on this path. It is going to be completely different. But the one thing that can be a constant is prayer. If we all pray and we pray that we are able to experience peace, not only in our own hearts, but others experience peace in their hearts too, then we are already going, in my mind, we're already walking in the right direction. Yes. Yeah. I I truly believe that, that that resonates for sure. Okay, thank you. And then I guess kind of my last question, um, and similarly, if if some say someone listening is sort of at a juncture in their lives, whether due to you know these events that have been unfolding or just their own personal journey, um, say that someone is you know, feeling that call from God and they're, as you did, as I did, and they're being 
called to do things that may seem uh, inexplicable, uh, confusing, and, and they don't really have a clear vision of, of what lies ahead, um, you know, and, and maybe this is the same answer. Maybe this is prayer as well, but, um, you no, know. No, I, I actually have a different answer. So I, you know, I, I'm saying this from, again, once again, um, I've had such a crazy journey, Heather, you know, becoming an atheist and then following Islam and then following Christianity and, you know, and then, of course, in the middle being, you know, completely going into the new age side and experiencing a lot of things on the other other side as well. Um, all I will say is that at any point in time, our journeys will take us through places and people that we will receive from and we are giving at the same time. I think that was the part that I wish somebody had explained to me because I never realized that at any point in time, I am both receiving and giving yes, all the time, right? And when this sinks in, there is a sense of responsibility that comes in, right? And so what I want to leave everyone with is no matter where you are in your journey, there is no such thing as a person that is more spiritually advanced than the other. There is no such thing. The Lord very clearly states in the Bible, very clearly states that even at the end, he gave the same amount of money. He gave the same amount of money to the workers that came first thing in the morning and who came 30 minutes before the day was over. He gave the same amount of grace, or I'm calling it money, but it what he said, what he was trying to say was that they received the same amount. Yes. No matter where in life you came in. St. Monica was feast day was yesterday. Her husband was uh, converted at his deathbed, wow. right? Even at your death, it is yes. not late. Yes. Right. So that is the first thing I want to leave everyone with is please don't ever, ever think that you are spiritually advanced than others around you. <laughs> In one snap of a knuckle, the person next to you who you considered was not worthy of attention or time or was not in your frequency or was not in your wavelength, that person can jump over you in one second because that is truly the power of the Lord. The Lord decides who he bestows his grace on. Yes. So that is the first thing that don't ever, ever look at another and think that you are worthier or less worthy compared to the person next to you. And then the second thing is that no matter where you are, love yes. love love and love it doesn't have to be the whole world it doesn't have to be the country it can be the person right next to you the person that you go to sleep with the person that you get up with the yes. person that you meet who comes to deliver your meal just one smile just smile and smile with love and that's it that's if you can do at least that for me you are one of the most spiritual people i know I, I truly do, do believe that. That brings to mind um, a quote from Neville Goddard um, that I heard recently. He said, if you truly love one, then you are in love with the entirety of the universe. If you can really, really yes. just love the one who is in front of you. I agree. That's it. That's I 100% agree. I I could not have stated it better. And Heather, you know a lot about my story. You know of the people who have come into my life, who have left my life. And I cannot explain to you the joy I have received from loving the people, fully loving people who have walked out on me, you know, yes. and the freedom that you receive by loving fully, you know. So it is, it is an honor. I look at these people as angels who yes. walked into my life and they gave me the opportunity to love them fully. And I'm so grateful. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and having that feeling of, of love without attachment, it's just a whole other, it's a whole other feeling, you know, <laughs> when, it's, when it's a truly selfless love, you know, mm -hmm. and that's something I'm, I'm certainly um, working on. <laughs> currently. Yeah, I mean, so. you know, like I said, you know, the, the books, it's kind of funny. There's one question, which book I'm telling you, the Bible is one of the, <laughs> the most amazing, 
you cannot call it, I think it's like demeaning it by calling it a book. You know, it's the word of God. It's a living word of God. And the Lord said, it states in there, you know, you have love is like the sun. Love is like the rain. Yes. You know, the sun shines on everybody, just and unjust, rains on everybody. You know, we have to love like that. We cannot love based on how others love us. We have to love no matter what, you know. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and the, I will say, I speak about that a lot. The Bible is just, once you begin to read it through the eyes of, of love, it, it just, it does truly come alive and it is the living word. And so I, I agree with that. It is sort of, you know, dismissive or diminutive to call it just a book. book yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah. And so, um, and so one, I guess, and I, one more last thing, and I, and I think I'll end with that, which is, um, you know, Heather, I realized today that everything I have is a gift. Everything I have is from the grace of the Lord, including my breath, for the Lord breathed into me, yes. you know. And so I look at the work that I do as a gift from the Lord. Breath work is a gift from the Lord, you know. So I, I just want to leave with that because I want everyone to know that don't worry don't worry when you are you are going to walk on the path you are on the path you will be on the path you're not on the path don't worry don't worry about anything because the reality of the matter is the lord just has to say the word he just has to say the word and your entire life will change from one moment to another which is what happened with me you know and so like how much i was seeking how much i was working towards wanting to be with him the lord noticed it and in his time he changed my entire world around and today i cannot explain to you the level of joy i have in my heart i never thought that at the age of 37 i would be here you know at 10 years or 15 years ago if you had asked me where do you think you'd be at 37 you know i would have said things about what i thought i would have materialistically yeah. you know but yeah. the level of joy and peace i have i am another girl heather just another girl. I don't even have over 2000 people following me on Instagram. You know, there's nothing yeah. special. Yeah. But when I tell you that the joy I feel today, when I go to church, when I'm around my fellow brothers and sisters, when I'm around my students, when I, when I, I just, I love in a way that I could never love before. And it is through the grace of the Lord that he gave me the ability to love the, like this. So today's reading is about talents. When the Lord gives us talents and we use the talents, then he best bestows us with grace. And if, he, if we don't use our talents, then he takes it away from us. That is today's reading, you know. And when I had first heard this reading a year ago, it shook me in my bones, Heather, shook me. Because I asked myself, oh my God, have I been using my talents? <laughs> <laughs> Right. Yeah, and so yeah. we all have, we all have what is in us. And even if it is a smile, we all have a smile. Yes. We all have a heart that we can love with. Just start from there. Keep it simple. Love the person next to you and smile. Just smile from your heart and you're already on the path. <laughs> Wow. Yes. That's so beautiful. Yeah. Th thank you so much, Shireen, for sharing your story and just for um, using your voice to impart love to, I know I feel it and I know anyone who is going to be listening to this certainly will as well. So thank you so much um, for your thank time. You. And I will, um, place your contact information your website and whatever social links um, in the description box so if you are in houston and in, in the area certainly check out um Sudaprim. and do you do you work online at all yes, uh, yes very much actually especially during this time of covid um okay. yeah i'm i'm definitely working a lot online as well okay perfect okay well i will um be sure to place that that information so that people can reach out to you should they feel called and um, and tell me I, I think you have a couple of uh, events coming up workshops in the next yes, month have, is that correct correct so I have um, I have a workshop in Dallas on 18th and 19th of September 
And uh, yeah, I mean, I would say I'm going through a huge shift right now. So I'm, uh, I think in the month of October, I'm going to have some new classes. I feel called to do something for mothers. I have a feeling I'm going to restart things that I probably kind of stopped. Uh, so maybe a couple of circles again, a woman's circle and a men's circle. So stay tuned. I think October is going to be an interesting month for me. Beautiful. So um, yeah, definitely going to change some things up. Perfect. Oh yeah, and, and every Sunday from 3 to 4.30, I have a class at, uh, at Suda Prime Studio. Okay, perfect, perfect. Okay, well, thank you again, Shireen, and thank you all for listening. Oh, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.